Hi, everyone. We're going to look at a video today from Mr. Breaker about the apostle to the Gentiles. He claims it's Paul. Peter says it's himself, and that's in Acts 15. We're going to go through that today. But what did, what do we see in Romans 11, 13? According to Mr. Breaker, and we'll show you the quote, Paul assumes he's the apostle to the Gentiles. That's what he says in Romans 11, 13. But we know, independently from the book of Acts, chapter 10, that the Holy Spirit gave the mission of being the apostle of the Gentiles solely to Peter, which Peter then in Acts 15, 7 gets up in front of all of the other apostles and James and says, we all know long ago, I was made the apostle to the Gentiles to bring the gospel to them. So that means there is no apostle uh, to the Gentiles whose name is Paul. It's Peter, not Paul. And um, number two, Paul's Damascus Road account is in Acts 9. That's one chapter before uh, Acts 10. And why is that important? Because uh, if you go back to what Peter's referring to, that long ago he said in Acts 15, 7, we know that the Holy Spirit chose me to be the uh, apostle to the Gentiles, but we know that occurred in Acts 10. So because of that, and you see Paul's Damascus Road account is Acts 9, it's significant that Paul was only a short time uh in the Christian fold, if you will. And shortly after Paul's involved in the, the church itself, the, the religion, I, I might say, is the decision is made to make Peter the apostle of the Gentiles. If you study the life of Paul, after just making one visit within three years to the apostles and spending a couple of weeks with Peter and sees the brother of Jesus named James, he then says for 14 years, he went away to Arabia. And he 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 claims, and he he did so because he didn't want to uh, get anything from the uh, from the uh, the apostles. He didn't want to uh, receive anything from them. They imparted nothing to me. He boasts in Galatians chapter two, and he clearly says that because of that, he got his rev superior revelations from Jesus of the ascended Jesus, the Jesus who had been in heaven. Who again, to repeat in Matthew twenty four verse five, he says this. What's the sign of my return? Am I going to show up in a private place, a wilderness road? Somebody's going to claim they met me there? No. Jesus says, no, it's going to be a universal appearance. Every eye will see me. That's in Matthew 24, verse 5, 17 to 24. Please go look at it. So we know that Paul didn't really meet the real Jesus, but more importantly, just looking at breakers, taking breakers, breakers looking at everything at face value. Well, he's misread everything here. Paul is not the apostle of the Gentiles. He's a self-appointed apostle of Gentiles, but that does not mean Jesus appointed to him, him to that office. When we look at Acts 9, there's no mention of the word apostle. There's no mention of a mission to the Gentiles. And that's the account that Luke actually was summarizing what he believed happened. There's two other times in Acts that Paul is alone being quoted in his rendition in, to others in speeches. But that's not the same as what Luke confirms what he believes happened. And the only account what, of what P, J, Luke thought really happened is in Acts 9. So that does not include any message about Paul being an apostle to the Gentiles. And, the thir and, and that basically is the third point. Jesus in Acts 9 says nothing about Paul being an apostle of any kind, not even to the Gentiles or anybody, to Jews, nobody. He's not called an apostle by Jesus in Acts 9, nor in 20, Acts 22, nor in Acts 26, when we are referring to these three, the three accounts of the vision account, two in Paul's speeches and one in Acts 9, where Luke is summarizing. Okay, so let's take a look at some of this detail. Here's Acts 15. This is uh, uh, where we hear from Peter speaking at the Jerusalem conference. And the apostles and elders came together for, to consider this matter. And when they had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, you know how that a good while ago God made the choice among us that Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. All right, so now I'm going to play for you the clip from Mr. Breaker. And I want you to, with this piece of information uh, etched in your brain now, that Peter was chosen long ago, and that refers back to Acts 10, long ago, to be the apostle to the Gentiles who would hear the gospel through his voice, okay? So now listen to Mr. Breaker's account. God sent Peter to start the church, but then later God used Paul, and that the church started with Jews, and then it changed over to Gentiles. And we who are Christians today, according to Romans 11:13, 13, 
are to follow Paul. Three times in the scriptures Paul says, follow me. So why is the Catholic Church trying to follow Peter instead of Paul? Peter was the apostle to the Jews. There were two keys listed. This was the first key, was to Jews. And there was another key, to Gentiles. And those who are saved today in the church are Gentiles. Okay, so you just heard Breaker tell you that Peter was to the Jews and Paul was to the Gentiles. Is that true or false? 100% false. And I mean false in the sense also of true ultimately because there is no nothing but self-serving statements by Paul that he is apostle to the Gentiles and that is indeed in Romans 11:13. But it's self-serving. That means it's his own word. You can't be your own witness to establish your own office. If you think about it, Jesus had uh, God Yahweh speak over his head at his baptism and said, this is my son, my beloved son, this day I've begotten you. And then again in the transfiguration, he tells the uh, three apostles who are present to listen to Jesus, which was a quotation of Deuteronomy 18, signifying Jesus is the prophet of Deuteronomy 18, something most Christians are not aware of, but something you need to study. And uh, take a look at Acts 3, verse 23, 21 to 23. Peter quotes that passage in Acts in uh Deuteronomy 18, to establish that Jesus is the prophet. But I digress. So anyway, Paul claims something in a self-declared way. He is the apostle of the Gentiles. What's true? Peter is the apostle of the Gentiles. This has nothing to do with the Catholic Church, by the way. The Catholic Church doesn't exist until Constantine. The, uh, and Peter is an apostle at Jerusalem. He travels to many places, but he's all over the place. He's at Antioch. He's at he's many places. He's actually the history of the early church is that Peter is spreading the Gentile to church churches in Gentile lands uh, extensively uh, for a long period of time. And then in Acts 10, he's told by the Holy Spirit uh, to do more than that. Now, now, I just want to show you, here's what you need to look at to see where what Peter is referring to when he says here, uh, you know how that a good while ago, God made a choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And that is here in Acts 10, verses 19 to 23 and 28. And you can read it at your leisure. But that's where Peter has, uh, the spirit comes down to Peter. He tells him to let in the, the uh, Cornelius and his family and friends and their Gentiles. And he then derives the deduction that he should not call a Gentile clean, unclean and let them in the house. And that's all that happens there. But in the bigger picture, it made Peter understand to no longer have any delay in getting the message to the Gentiles. And so he starts a mission to the Gentiles. And that was his office to, within the 12, that he that was his, his assignment to go to the Gentiles. Now, did Paul's Jesus on the road to Damascus give Paul any assignment to be an apostle to anybody? And this is Luke's actual account. The other two accounts you'll read in Acts 22 and 26 are actually just Paul giving speeches. He says essentially the same thing. He never says in those accounts either that Jesus said he'd be an apostle, but I'm just saying these are different. This is where Luke is telling you what he understands. Remember in Luke chapter one of his gospel, one to three, he says, I'm, he's addressing most excellent Theophilus in the book of Luke and the book of Acts. And he says, I'm relying upon what I believe are reliable witnesses. He's not claiming inspiration. You got to get that straight. He's translating the Hebrew gospel of Matthew. We now know from scholarship, that's his gospel. And then he's doing the book of Acts, which is an historical work in order to win an appeal that is pending at the end of the book of Acts of Paul to the Roman emperor Nero for him to uh, find him innocent, which he does actually of his friend Trophimus to finally the temple. Okay. Focus now on this. I'm going to read this. And he, Paul, fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecute you me? And he said, who are you, sir? The word there is curios. And when you're addressing someone you haven't met before, you address them politely as sir. And in Greek, that would be curios. You, just like in uh, Downton Abbey, you address the, the person who's higher in status than you, you, you call them Lord. But it doesn't mean you think they're God. Just so, so we keep that clear. Who art thou, sir? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you persecute. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling in his thigh, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him. Now, here's where, if Paul had been appointed an apostle, this is where you expect it to be. But this is all that happens. Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what you shall do. 
And Jesus never appears to Paul in Damascus, not at all, and never talks to him one on one like this again in, in this in this account or any of the accounts. OK, in other accounts, he actually has Jesus appearing only in a trance while he's at the temple. And then another time appearing to him when he's in a, a guard guarded barrack room and it's a brief conversation. And he doesn't say he's a, he's the messenger to the Gentiles either there there or the apostle. Rise and go into the city and you shall be told what you shall do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. So they couldn't see in that light. OK, but they heard the voice. So this is not an extra. This is not in Paul's head. This is an actual appearance of Jesus. Allegedly, Jesus, Jesus says, I'm not coming back in the wilderness road. We know that once he ascended in Acts one, he ain't coming back until every eye sees him. So we know this isn't really Jesus, just to be clear again. But on the other hand, we want to understand, does Paul even have the tether of having been told by Jesus, his Jesus, that you're going to be an apostle to Gentiles? I believe God restricted these type of things to ever come out of Paul's mouth when they're false. God did not want us to be misled and think Paul had actually had a, any witnesses that he had been appointed the apostle to the Gentiles. And also notice these men have no names. There, there are the men present. They should be the most famous people in the world to verify this account, but you have no verifications and you therefore have no witnesses and therefore this account has no reliability. But Luke believes it for purposes of defending Paul on an appeal. that this, And that's why he's going to put it in here. Okay. So, and Saul arose in the earth and he, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man, but they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was there three days without sight. And neither did he eat nor drink. Okay. So now Breaker is saying what? That Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles. False, false, false. That's Paul's self-proclamation. That doesn't mean it's true. I mean, uh, if I say I'm the king of England, does that mean I'm the king of England? What if I said it a hundred times? It doesn't make me the king of England. I have to have proof. Jesus had that kind of proof, ladies and gentlemen. That's the big difference. He had multiple witnesses at his baptism. When Yahweh speaks over his head and blesses him and says, this is day of begotten and he's my begotten son. And then over in the... Uh, and the tra the the transfiguration the G Jesus has uh, Yahweh again speak over him and says listen to him and there are three apostles present James John and Peter so this is God does that in order so that you can have confidence that more than one person saw this event and can verify but Peter excuse me Paul has zero nothing nada zilch okay so that's important remember you're supposed to do a test God t says if I'm going to allow false prophets false messengers to come and mislead you. I'm going to allow them. I'm not sending them, but I'm going to allow them to test you, to prove you whether you love me with your whole heart, mind, and soul. That's in Deuteronomy 13, 1 to 5. And God says, if they teach you to apostatize against the law I've given this guy Moses here today, then you know they're not from me. T take them out to the woodshed and execute them is actually what he says at the end, if somebody comes to teach you away from my law that I gave this guy, Moses, here today, execute him and don't have mercy on him because he is trying to lead you astray from the path of, that will save your soul. OK, so God is very clear what he thinks about those type of teachers. And we know independently of this, that that's exactly fits Paul. He teaches in Galatians 3, 19, the law was given by angels, the Torah law was given by angels through a mediator, meaning Moses. And then he goes on to say in Galatians 4, verse 9, that the that don't be in bondage to these weak and beggarly celestial beings. Vincent uh, tells us that even though it's translated as elements in the King James, it really means celestial beings, referring back then to the angels of Galatians 3, 19, the ones who gave the law through, through to Moses, not Yahweh, but angels, which is totally false. Yahweh is the one speaking in Exodus 20. Take a look. Four times he's quoted as the speaker by Moses. No angels are talking. And then uh, he, uh, uh, Vincent says, if you look at the uh, commentary of Vincent on Galatians 4, verse 9, he says that reference to the weak and beggarly angels is back a reference to who gave the law, the Torah, to Moses, the mediator. Okay, so I think we've made the point here is that a Breaker has misdirected you to think that that Paul, one who has no 
verification of his claim of being an apostle to the Gentiles, that Paul is the apostle of the Gentiles. That's what Breaker wants you to believe, when in fact the Bible only supports that everyone had a, a knowledge that Peter had been chosen in that experience with Cornelius, and of course Cornelius verified it as well, because God Yahweh spoke to him as well, or the uh, an angel spoke to uh, uh, Cornelius in Acts 10. So we have verification there at that time. We also have it, obviously, the 12 heard this when account prior to Paul, uh, excuse me, prior to Peter speaking in Acts 15. So it was all verified many, many years prior to Acts 15, which is many years after Acts 10. But Paul has no verification. And notice also, if you read Acts 15, Paul does not get up and say, I was the, I was appointed apostle of the Gentiles. He says nothing. Romans, by the way, Romans is after Acts 15 by by a long shot. It's Galatians is, is approximately about this time, just so you know. And uh, or, you know, subsequently to the Acts 15 conference, he's making commentaries probably on this. And then Romans comes many epistles afterwards and many years later. So Paul was silent in Acts 15. Then in Romans 13, he has more courage to say, oh, well, I'm the apostle of the Gentiles. Well, it's self-serving, Paul. And why didn't you speak up when you had a chance that you somehow have some special revelation from Jesus making you an apostle? But Luke couldn't find it out. Even though he's interviewing you, you never said it yourself in two speeches in Acts 22 or Acts 26. And then in Acts 9, Luke gives his lukewarm account for you, which you, you ba the, the account he believes is true is that you had no further communications right on the spot with Jesus at the, with who you thought was Jesus Paul because he gives you no you had no words you put no words in Jesus mouth other than you're going to find out when you need to know when you go to the city of Damascus and then Jesus never appears to him there he he there's some secondary person who's claiming they had a vision of Jesus and somehow that's going to communicate things even more unverifiable unverifiable claims from people who cannot be proved to be independently a prophet of God. So you have a lot of chains of, of speculation and unfounded, unsubstantiated, biblically inadequate claims to be prophets. People just can't, you just darn a prophet because you claim you have a vision or a dream. That's not how it works. Okay. Now, I just want to say this. Breaker said in Romans eleven thirteen that Jesus said, uh, excuse me, that Paul said, follow me there. Now, I don't know why this matters much to him. It doesn't make Paul an apostle or prove that he's an apostle just because he self-declares, follow me. But let's just go through it. He was wrong. It's a mistake. Everybody makes mistakes. I, I believe it's an honest mistake. He meant to say Romans eleven thirteen is where Paul claims to be an apostle of Gentiles. But when does Paul say, follow me? He does say that three times. Wherefore, in 1 Corinthians 4, 16, wherefore I beseech you be ye followers of me doesn't ask you to be followers of Jesus. Don't you find that a little strange, everybody? First Corinthians 11, verse 1, be ye followers of me, even as I am of Christ. Is he really a follower of Christ? Paul says in Romans 3, verse 7, that if by my lie the, the glory of God is advanced, why am I still called a sinner? Did Jesus ever talk like that? No. But he wants these people in Corinth to believe that Jesus talks like that. Jesus said that freely you gave, freely you received. So when you preach the gospel, you cannot take any money because freely you received, you have to freely give. But you can make a living if you go into someone's house and you do work worthy of their wage. That's where you take care of their farm animals and their crops. Jesus, and that's a very well-known law of hospitality. That's all Jesus ever allowed. And that's in Matthew 10. 10.10 10, though says you can't take any money from the people you're, you're preaching to. You have to get it from someone you're working for in their home who's worthy and you stay with them in their home. Very different. Well, what does Paul say to the Corinthians? He says, oh, well, there's this rule that uh, you can't muscle an ox. And you know what? It's all together for our favorite favor. The, that means the pastors and the elders who are, are preaching and teaching, they all get money. That's what Paul established at Corinth. So he wants them to follow himself, and he claims he's following Christ, but he's definitely teaching a different doctrine that there's such things as pastors in the first place. Jesus says there's only one pastor. That's John 10, 16, where it says, Jesus says, I'm your only pastor. Where do we get this idea of multiple pastors? Oh, because Paul says there's been appointed teachers and pastors, shepherds, see? So that's where you get this wrong idea that you're allowed to have this office when you're not even supposed to have any hierarchy at all. You're supposed to simply all be brothers and sisters and have one teacher, one rabbi, and that's Jesus. And that's all, all I can teach you is to follow Jesus. And that's, that's fulfilling the role 
that we have, but we don't have this office. There's no there's no authority that anybody has independently of the word of God. And that's what we're looking at here. And we're seeing and testing the words that God tells us to test for false prophets. If they speak contrary to my word, tell you not to follow my Torah, you're there, false prophets and their apostates, and you must execute them. Not listen, not only not listen to them, that's just, that goes without saying, but you're supposed to kill them. And uh, that's how severe a crime it is to do what Paul did in Galatians chapter uh, two, verse, uh, excuse me, three, chapter three, verse 19, the law was given by angels, not by God, Yahweh. And then they're weak and beckoning angels who gave the law. That's now insulting God indirectly when you know that God is the actual speaker uh, in, in the book of Exodus, the account of the 10 commandments. All right. So, uh, and it's one more Philippians three seventeen. brethren, be followers together of me and mark them, which will, which walk. So as ye have us for an example. So I think what he's saying there is follow me and then mark those who are following me and and follow them as your example. So, uh, again, this is uh, do you think any of the other apostles would wanted people to follow them would say, follow me? I'm Peter. Follow me. No, that's divisive. It should be you're following Jesus. That's what who you follow. You don't follow apostles. You follow Paul. <laughs> I said it myself. You follow Jesus. Not Paul, not Bob, not not anybody but Jesus. That's it. All right. Now, with all that background and and resetting the framework in which to understand what Mr. Breaker is saying, I'm going to replay his clip I played for you earlier and then see if you cannot see now the techniques, how words are manipulated and concepts are manipulated to mislead you. Maybe he's doing it deliberately. Maybe he's not. Maybe he's just simply forgets. He doesn't even know himself what the Bible teaches and says. And he's going to say, Paul's the apostle to the Gentiles. Peter is the apostle to the Jews. Follow what he's doing. And then you know the truth. It's not true. Paul is a self-serving claim to being apostle to the Gentiles. So it's an unfounded claim. So you can just dismiss he is that. We don't. We have no proof that's true. But Peter, we do have true proof that he is the apostle to the Gentiles. This was accepted uh, in Acts 15 as something that had been long ago established, and we know where that account occurs, where multiple witnesses are involved in that situation with the Spirit on speaking to Peter and an angel speaking to um, the, uh, the, the gentleman Cornelius. So here we go. Listen again and tell me, use your critical thought as, I'm, as you're hearing it to then realize how to deflect these kind of mis misstatements Deliberate or not, doesn't matter. You need to know, you need to keep Bible truth in your head as you hear what, what Mr. Breaker is saying. So let's go. God sent Peter to start the church, but then later God used Paul. And that the church started with Jews, and then it changed over to Gentiles. And we who are Christians today, according to Romans 11, 13, are to follow Paul. Three times in the scriptures, Paul says, follow me. So why is the Catholic Church trying to follow Peter instead of Paul? Peter was the apostle to the Jews. There were two keys listed. This was the first key, was to Jews. And there was another key, to Gentiles. And those who are saved today in the church are Gentiles. All right, so I want to show you using some logic that lawyers use that helps anybody to understand and listen to people talking. So what he's done, he's given you a misdirection that the question or issue is between Paul versus Peter. Paul, Paul is distinct from Peter and therefore they're, but they're allegedly both apostles. So if Peter is saying one thing and Paul is saying another, they're on the same level. So Peter can't cancel out Paul, right? They're the same level. So he's doing that deliberately. He's misdirecting you that the issue is uh, that who has superiority. And the answer is none of them, neither of them have superiority over the other. Okay. Jesus has superiority. And Jesus says that in John 13, 16, he says, no apostle is greater than the one who sent him. So in each instance, neither Peter nor Paul are superior to Jesus. So that's who's in charge. Not These guys are delegated to serve as his messengers. That's what the word apostle actually means. There are people that in uh, under Greek law, which became well-known and stayed in uh, verbiage that was used in the Roman era, 
when Jesus was on earth, that apostle meant somebody who was given a letter that they had to protect with their life, that they couldn't lose, and it should the seal cannot be broken, and it has to be delivered unopened. And if you did, if you opened it and you tried to change the message or do anything to the message, you would sub you would be punished severely and killed uh, typically. So that's what an apostle meant, and that's why it was a significant legal term. And that that doesn't give them authority. Now, Jesus actually gave the apostles the authority to be the 12 judges over Israel, okay? And that meant they'd be the judges of the kingdom. And that's a very important fact. But that's separate and apart from being messengers, uh, apostles of Jesus Christ, and carrying that faithfully and not tampering with his words and not tampering with his message. So this is not an issue between Paul and Peter. This is an issue between Paul and Jesus. And he did not get this authority from Jesus. He got this from a vision of somebody who said he was Jesus on the road to Damascus at a time when Jesus already had ascended in Acts 1, where Jesus has now clearly said he will not be coming back in a wilderness place, a private place, a road, or a barracks, or anything like that. He's When he returns, the sign of his coming will be a universally seen event from east, every point east and every point west. The, the Greek there in Matthew 24, verses 5 and 20. 1 to 24, those words east and west are pluralized in Greek, meaning every point east, every point west. So now the second thing is a falsehood in this whole thing, that Peter is an apostle to the Jews. You said that clear as day. You can see it right there. It's still there. And Paul is to the Gentiles. Do you see that? Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles, implying Peter is not at all an apostle to the Gentiles, when in fact, in Acts 15, it was recognized and accepted that Paul, Peter, that Peter was the apostle to the Gentiles. And that's while Peter's, excuse me, that's why James, while James is sitting at the head of the table, apparently is the, the last word to sum up the decisions, okay? And he's the brother of Jesus. And the 12, the, the uh, it's, in, it's in the book of Thomas, I should tell you, the gospel of Thomas that was discovered, but it's also in quotes uh, of the Hebrew Matthew that namely that Jesus, when he was resurrected, and before he sends, he tells the apostles to follow James, my brother, wherever you go. Uh, and, and then he makes some statement that the heavens and earth came into existence for the benefit of, of his brother James. Interesting statement, but regardless. But the point is that James is there sitting, the 12 apostles are sitting there, and they all accept and agree that Peter had previously been the one chosen to be the Apostle of the Gentiles, by God directly in that Acts 10 account is what they're referring to. So we have no evidence that Paul's an apostle to the Gentiles. We only have evidence that Peter is. So you see what's happening here is people are reading things and gullibly accepting anything Paul says. That's not how you test things. And then then trying to denigrate who is the who does Paul have to beat out? Peter? No, he has to beat out. Uh, he has to beat out uh, Jesus. And that means if Paul is contradicting Jesus in all of his doctrines, which is clearly true, Jesus never said the law was given by angels through a mediator and, that was, and those angels were weak and beggarly. But Paul says that in Galatians 3, 19 and 4, verse 9. That's a very significant problem. That's Paul's first epistle. Three, three epistles earlier, or three major epistles earlier than uh, uh, Romans. Okay, so he's... This is well established that he is definitely an apostate well before he's written Romans. But even in Romans, he tells you, oh, Sabbath, it's, you know, any day you think is good, you can uh, you can follow. You don't have to worry about any particular day. And uh, weak people and weak people, weak in faith, care about what day of the week to uh, rest and worship. So, no, 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 no. That's false. In, in uh, Acts 15, they actually said to the Gentiles, they said, here, we're giving you three, these three rules, but every week from now on, you're going to be hearing the, God, the law read to you, and uh, as it has been for you know millennia, meaning you're going to learn more as you go. I don't have to give you 100 rules. I don't have to give you 10 rules. I just have to tell you, here's four rules that I want you to do right now. That's what you start from. They were a start of set of rules. They weren't the end point, but that's how you are misled by your teachers because they don't read you that verse in Acts 15 where James makes this statement. Okay, well, anyway, I hope that helps everybody understand that when you hear people uh, use, uh, let me, one more thing I want to say. When you see people using a chart like this, this is this is deliberately, uh, how can I say it? 
It's to give you the sense that they have proof or evidence, but they have no proof. Just putting things up that are false doesn't make it true. But people have this general idea that if I if you put something up there that's false, unverified, viably false, is you, you somehow it's true. Don't be deceived by charts and graphs. Wait for someone to show you Bible verses. This look, if somebody shows you Bible verses, believe them <laughs> that they're there. If someone quotes and crops it out of the text and puts it in front of you. Believe that. If if someone is clearly grabbing something off the, this is from Logo Software, by the way. If you can see, this is not something Doug made up and wrote for, especially for you guys. No, this is what you need. You need to insist on level of proof, not just verbiage. And I mean, every single video you see on the internet, if they're not following this methodology, I would just say you're wasting your time. That's my point. You can't be sure what you're hearing because nobody is testing what they're saying. And I want you to see something else. This Mr. Breaker made a mistake by claiming that, I want to show you this, remember this? He said that in Acts, in Romans eleven thirteen, he said that it, Paul said there, follow me. Now, everybody makes mistakes. But that's why it's better to always have proof and make sure you put it up on the screen so the audience, the people watching, can verify. If you're watching videos that the person doesn't do that, I would say stop watching them. But I want to show you the best kind of stuff that you'll see. And even if I don't agree with Tobias Singer about everything, the one thing you see he does, he always, put the, he always puts the Bible verse up in front of you so you can see it. And he makes a big point about that. Hey, he says, you can just read it yourself. Pick any Bible he tells you. And that's what I'm trying to say is if if you look at Mr. Breaker, he is not doing any of those things. Is he saying here's a Bible verse? No. Is he showing you any Bible verses? No. He does this in every of his sermons. They're just simply thrown up there. He may cite the verse, but he doesn't put the words up there because when you're using these kind of charts, you don't have the time. You don't, you know, where are you going to put the, the t text up? He has every opportunity to do what I'm doing, right? But he doesn't do it that way. He presents it as if he's talking to you in a school class, just like a teacher where everything has to be accepted gullibly because you don't have an opportunity to, to uh, dispute it. Now, I just want to say this. When your teacher teaches you in class, your teacher may do the very same thing, but there's a difference. Your teacher is uh, paid to tell you the truth. <laughs> the, their salary doesn't depend upon having a certain view of truth or not. That ma Math will always be math, and you can't bribe them to teach math differently than it really is, or geometry, or English grammar, or whatever. They cannot be influenced to corrupt the teaching they would give you so that it would be false, or fit a narrative, or suit a certain doctrine or a pet doctrine or whatever. The problem is when people like this are teaching you and they are seeking money from you or they're seeking funding or whatever, this ultimately is uh, fostering the idea that you don't have to prove anything to me and I'm just going to accept anything you say. He uses his charts, his his uh, writings on the, on the board just like that. Never a Bible verse. Never. I don't remember seeing one Bible verse that he ever throws up on the screen, which he could even do in post-production. I do it all the time. I, I, I go back over and I go, hey, let's throw something up here just because I mentioned it in the video. But he never does that at all. So this is a very, uh, 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 this is a method of learning that will lead you astray. Not that he's deliberately doing it. I'm not claiming he's deliberately choosing this method to, to dumb things down and make you accept gullibly, but he doesn't give you any options. He doesn't really give you any options of making a, a, a decision while you're watching him that what he's saying could move your heart to believe anything he's saying. And that to me is ultimately not a good thing to spend your time, and I think it's wasteful. Only if someone is willing and courageous enough, and it takes courage to, put a, to sit back and research each thing. And I'm just gonna show you something. Um, I had watched the video on this very issue and the person before made a mistake. And he said that Paul never said three times, follow me. And he did, and I actually got this clip out of his, his uh, commentary, but he made himself look foolish because what did he do? He did the same thing Mr. Breaker does. He doesn't research. And then he said there was no times. And I said to myself, well, you know, that's not true. I know he said, follow me. So I, I wanted to correct that. And uh, I, I thought I would teach a lesson about don't, if you correct Paul incorrectly because you're not doing your own research and you say he didn't say something when he did, then you have t taken the movement to correct the Bible, to get Paul tested properly 
by if you misrepresent Paul is not saying the word follow me three times, which is this other guy did at a Catholic channel, is you're not helping the cause. You're not helping truth because now you are a, a fabricator of lies. Not what, that you deliberately did this, sir, but that's what you ended up doing. And we need to raise the bar, the standard. When you want to present something, you have to present actual evidence and proof of what you are saying to be taken credibly. And that is best by quoting and cropping out pictures of the actual uh, Bible verses and putting them in front of the audience so they can make a decision, not you dictating to them they have to follow whatever you're saying. All right. Anyway, I hope this helped in more ways than one, that from now on, turn off channels that don't do uh, present the Bible verses. Don't, don't, why bother? If they're not, they're not even trying to persuade you. They're just trying to throw uh, talk at you. Don't listen to that anymore. Pay attention to what the Word of God says and then use this to help you in your Bible study time. All right, God bless everybody. Ciao. Bye.